First of all, I really want to thank you for your epic response on my social media pages, especially Twitter and Instagram, where I almost had like 30,000 views in total, lots of uh, comments and feedback on my crystal turntable. So I'm really excited about that and it really keeps me going and motivates me. And as you can see, I followed your advice or your suggestion. This is now a fully step-by-step -step tutorial. I'm going really into depth. This is almost like a paid course. Uh, kind of detail so um, you will find chapter markers all over so you can skip and check out the sections you want to look at um, and yeah obviously leave me some feedback below how you like this more detailed um, content all right and another big thank you for everyone for your continued support here on my youtube channel um, especially in the past couple of months uh, where i haven't been super active um, because um, I was quite engaged work-wise. I transitioned from industrial light and magic to image engine, um, working on some very big shows. Um, one of them is the book of Boba Fett and the other one was the Obi-Wan show when I was really engaged working as a lighting lead. I hope you liked and enjoyed the visuals. Um, Story-wise, it's debatable, but we don't have to go into that. Um, but yeah, so as you know, I, I do have a full-time job on the side. so. Um, I do this YouTube training stuff um, when I have some spare time. Um, yeah, so I hope you uh, enjoy that. And if you like what I do, uh, I would appreciate um, all the support. You know what to do. All right, so now let's talk about the crystal. I'm sure you have seen the renders, but here's another 4K version of it. So enjoy that as well. Um, and you will see it has quite a few very um, fine details, which add a lot of realism to it. Um, and in this whole step-by-step -step tutorial, I want to talk about the steps, the thought processes I had to to make these decisions to um, add the horizontal lines, to add the crack, to add the dispersion, um, the volumes and all this stuff and even the calm workflows we will be doing a nuke later on. So I'll be going into detail of everything. So even if you don't want to do a crystal or whatever, um, I'm showing lots of super interesting techniques. Um, I think uh, for everyone, there's something to learn from this video. So make sure to watch it and follow the chapter markers if there are certain things uh, which interest you. Also, if I'm moving too fast or too slow, you can obviously always go uh, and rewind or whatever. I guess you know how YouTube works. Uh, but what I wanted to say is um, the scene files I'm creating here on Houdini, on Nuke side, um, all the reference I use to create this project, all the rendered files, um, the QuickTimes, um, they are available on my Patreon account. So um, if you want to check that out, um, you get access to all my previous tutorials as well. So it's a great thing to sign up for and also to support me on, on the same, same side. One last thing before we start with the crystal step-by-step -step tutorial is uh, the CG Lounge has a super awesome VFX community. Um, the invite link is below in the description. Uh, we are currently having a CG crystal challenge. Um, it is starting now once this video is uploaded and it will go for two weeks. So make sure to join it because we have an amazing uh, prize. You can win up to $300 in render credits with uh, the Fox Render Farm. And that allows you to render your personal projects. It's just a great sponsorship uh, combined with our challenges. And also you will be part of this amazing community. So uh, make sure to follow the link below and join the CG Lounge. Thank you so much. And now let's get going. So here we are in Houdini and let's just get started by going into the object context and creating a geo node and just rename this uh, to geo crystal and this is where we will be modeling everything. So if I dive in here, um, we have an empty network and the first thing I want to do is just create a tube object and this will give us our starting point. So um, what I want to do um, first of all is make sure that we um, cap it and we want to have just six um, columns here. So to kind of get a kind of shape that we want. And I am basing this main render of, of this reference. So I think this uh, fits it quite closely. And this is also very similar to the render I created. So uh, first off the bat, you can see we have kind of six, roughly six um, edges here. Um, this is at least uh, what I'm thinking it is. And you can see the shapes are a little bit crooked and um, it's not perfectly how you would 
do a CG render in general. Um, and then you can see we've got these uh, horizontal lines. We've got a, a quite strong edge damage all over the place. And then we also have um, this um, going through like this kind of crack. And at the bottom, we also have um, a, a more rougher defined shape. So these are the things I want to look at. And the first thing what we want to do now is get everything set up, um, prepare everything for kind of a render, and then we will be fine tuning everything. So obviously the first thing to do is um, to shape everything up so we can create something what uh, we think is necessary. So first of all, I want to create a tube with some subdivisions. I want to grab the top edges. And if you want to stay procedural, you can create a group node, which will um, has which has an option to create edges for you. And I'll just rename this to top um, ledge or edge or whatever. I want to switch it to edges. So you can see we're selecting all the edges. Go to the normal mode. Make sure you are from the top direction. And then changing the spread angle, you will see that we now just grab the top ones. After that, I want to do an edge collapse. And this will give me already um, what I'm after. So I'm just making sure to pick that edge. And then we've got this nice uh, shape. All I do now then is um, a quite simple mirror. But before, I want to delete the bottom um, geo piece. And you could do the same again with a, with a group node. Um, set this this time to um, bottom, like so. And then we switch it from edges to prims. And then instead of um, one, we go minus one. So now we have the bottom piece. Then we can do a blast, but you can also just put it, uh, do it manually, right? So it's it's if you want to stay procedural, this is kind of the way to do it, but you don't have to. Um, after that, a mirror, and uh, if you shift enter, it will automatically connect to your last node. And if I now do my direction to vertical, and um, I probably need to do either offset it like this or just change it to negative. Um, if I now connect it, you will see that the points will snap like that. And now we kind of have this uh, shape. Let's see if it actually does. It's actually not. So we would need to increase the seam. And now you can see now they stuck together. And now we have one mirrored object. Um, this is roughly the basic shape what I want to do. For now, I can just do a quick bevel. Um, we will not be using this in the end, but I just want to do it for now. So you can see actually um, what we are dealing with. Um, so this is now the bevel. We just might, we want to um, ignore flat edges. So now we can specify an angle. So only certain angles would get beveled. Um, and this is a pretty good starting point. Um, for now, let's just do a control enter. I'm using um, OD tools, um, which, ha which has several different uh, shortcuts built in. So it's a super nice convenience. Um, tool set and you can get that from the link in the video description. It's called OD Tools. Um, I like to work with Geo and RNDR um, group nodes. Just it's an ease of uh, convenience for me to set up the render settings and everything like that. I tend to colorize my Geo nodes to be blue. I don't know, just to have it. And then a Geo node for render, which I typically do uh, like a red. And I always prefix this with R and DR, and then this would be crystal. Sometimes I do crystal geo if I am rendering more pieces, so I want to do that as well. Um, and this is what it is. Um, in here, I want to get my out geo, so I could just copy this node um, and go in here and hit Control Shift B, and this will create me an uh, input. So now in my render context, I have this. It's just an object merge which automatically fills in the path, so it's a, another convenience function for OD tools. Lots of shortcuts which help me to get uh, along. And next up, let's jump holding in into the rub context, creating an Arnold render node. Um, I do have my um, presets in here. You will see R and DR, and I also want to add the lowercase R and DR. Sometimes I use upper, sometimes lower. Um, but you'll also notice that I have my render paths. I do have my AOV set up, so all of this fancy stuff. And again, you can get all of this, like these are custom light path expressions. So it's it's a little bit more production uh, AUVs, which I set up for my case. Uh, the link is in the description. If you want to get the source files and get all of my AUVs, I will not go into detail on how I created those. Um, these are my default settings. Nothing too crazy. Let's just call this um, crystal. Uh, crystal, like that. Um, and then we will go into back into our object level. 
and I want to create a light. So if I go to the Arnold tab, you can uh, click the Sky Dome and once you to place it, which is a bit weird, you don't need to place it, it's uh, an infinite light. Um, what I do now is I will use the OD tools preset library. I want to switch to um, HDRIs, so I'll go down here. HDRI Haven, and then I want to look for something interesting. I think I like this veranda one, so I just need to double click and it will do everything for me right away. And then all I gotta do is uh, hit refresh here. This will generate me a TX file and I would be good to render. So we can rename this to EMV light or whatever. Uh, one last thing, go into the material context, create an Arnold material builder. I, I tend to call my simple shaders base. Um, this will be my standard surface um, shader, which is a neutral gray. So this is my settings, nothing crazy. And then I'll go to object level and the crystal geo, we can assign the material, go to mat, go to base. And all we got to do now is create a render cam. What I'll do, I'll just copy and paste a camera so it will be the same as in my final render. Um, these are just the settings, so nothing crazy again. Camera, this is now obviously the placement. So currently my crystal is somewhere. Um, what I need to do, what I always do is, at least for this, is uh, access align. And uh, access. also I have labs installed. So if you want to follow along, make sure to um, install labs. Uh, match size, it will always um, put your things um, to the origin. You will see it's in zero, zero. It's obviously a super large crystal right now. So I like to just um, scale it to fit. So it fits into uh, one, one space. Uh, and now it's pretty much what I had in my original render. So super basic stuff. And if I now would go to the render view, I think we should have everything in place. So let's just hit render. And yeah, we do see something. And this is also the HL I used uh, for my final piece. And all I wanna do now is just rotate it uh, on 90. So we kind of have the same thing. And then I would like to go to my contribution and make sure that camera is off. Like uh, just zero it out. And there we have it. So um, I still want to change my render resolution. I will just do this in the global. So I go to edit, uh, sorry, to render, edit render uh, node. And in here, I do want to go to um, override camera resolution. I can do half. Uh, it works obviously for my resolution. Sometimes you can't specify yourself. Um, now we are on 960, so it's a little bit faster to do interaction. Um, and this is my basic setup. And from now, we will be doing way more advanced stuff. We will be breaking up the shapes, making everything way more interesting. All right, so the first thing what I want to do is uh, look at my reference. And as I said before, I do want to break up the outside edges. So the first thing is um, to get the this nice, um, yeah, not straight lines, right? It's, it's pretty bulgy. It's not really a perfectly straight um, object, right? So this is something I want to do as the first thing to get the general silhouette um, plotted in. All right, so geocrystal, this is where we will be working in. I will delete the poly bevel. I don't care about this for now. Um, all I want to do though is do a remesh so we get some kind of detail in this so I can actually do the bending properly. So um, right now it's uh, pretty coarse. Um, I want to probably go to 0.05 or so. So even probably more, um, something like that for now. And then after that, I want to do a mountain, which is the, uh, it's a great surface operator to just um, get some detail in here. So I'm disabling normal and I'm just uh, re re really reducing the, the height. Um, something very small. And then all I'm doing is really increasing the, the size of the extruded or of the, of the noise pattern itself. And then all I have to play with is um, a little bit of the roughness in the fractal. So how detailed I want it to be and then um, about the offset, where I want it to happen. So if I look through um, the render cam, uh, again, playing a bit with the size of this thing, and maybe even with the amplitude, maybe um, put it to 0 0.2. Um, and then it's again, as I said, it's just the offset until you find something you really like. Um, again, it's, it's quite arbitrary. So I just played around until I found something uh, I liked. So I'll just do the same and play around until I find something. All right, so I also increased, uh, reduced the target size so I get, uh, get a little bit more detail. And again, this is up to your taste. So if you feel this is too strong, obviously you just file it down. 
And then after the, that, um, I want to look at the edge damage. And you can see it's really broken up here and it has all these uh, fine details. And first of all, um, to get a high detail, you want to have a high enough um, geometry here. So right now, this is still a little bit too coarse. Uh, but the cool thing is, um, the I'm using the lab's edge damage node. Um, it, it does what it says it does. So it will find, it will voxelize the geo. And then based on that, it will it will create um, these edge damages. And right now, this is um, currently the quality of this, so it's super soft. So uh, what you want to do here is obviously play with the voxel size. So we can probably try 05. And then you can see it gets more detailed. And we can maybe go even, uh, let's go 25. This is highly dependent on your size. So this is why I like to scale my things um, in the 1-1 one, one, um, range. You can already see now we get some nice little chips here and there. And you can also obviously increase with the amount. Um, you get away way more um, broken up pieces. Always look through the shot camera. You can see what you're getting. And then resolution is um, how how much data you want to give the the broken up um, pieces. Like how much detail you want to have in here. You can see now it got it got a little bit more detailed. Obviously the amount is now too much. And now what I like to do, which is a little bit more advanced, if you don't feel too comfortable with these things, you can obviously skip over this section, but I want to go into this edge damage node and add even more additional details because you can see I've got lots of geo actually to play with, but it's not really giving us the detail I would like to see. So if I go in here and say, uh, allow editing of contents, I can now dive in this node and see all the glory of the details. And What's happening now is um, we are looking through the voxel mesh. And in the end, this is generating a geo from a VDB, a voxel mesh from, from this input geo, and then it is doing a VDB fracture. And then it's blasting the opposite. And this is essentially what is left over. And if we increase the detail in this mesh, we might get a little bit more detail out of the fracture. And this is something I like to do. So I'll just create a mountain. Again, a mountain, like I keep doing them all the time. And you can now see, obviously, it's way more broken and it should be reduced to the amplitude and really just crank it up a little and change the element size to something very small. And then again, reduce the amplitude and just add these fine details. You can go on the fractal, increase the roughness um, just to have something more in here. And let's see if it did anything for us. Um, if I view now the blast, you can now see we do have more. But disable this is before and after. So we have these finer details. So let's see how the, the end result looks like. Um, we definitely have more structure, right? I guess it's it's overall too much, uh, too broken up. Um, so I will reduce the amount back to three. You can see now we have a little bit less, but it's still uh, more detail, which is great. So maybe 2.5. And you, you play, again, how, how much you want to have it damaged. I think this is pretty cool. And, and another thing what you can do, if you look at the ref, you will see that it's mainly broken up at the bottom and maybe a little bit here at the top or, or here all the way up there. Um, and this is something you can do as well, which is great um, because this supports masking. So what I can do now, I can go to my top level. I can do uh, attribute paint. The default parameter for the paint is a mask attribute, which is perfect. So all I can do now is if I paint, let's say, um, on, on this ledge here and, and maybe a little bit here and maybe a little bit there, and I then uh, view the result, this will now take the mask into consideration. And these elements here should not be getting any breakup. And you can see now they are pretty clean and nothing is happening. If I, let's say, um, I don't like that this edge is so messed up, I can just uh, paint a little here and then view from the edge damage node, and then uh, we shouldn't have that much break, break up here. And there you go, it's gone. And this is the beauty of it. And you can then, if you finally find something that you like, uh, you can also go in here and reduce the voxel size even further. Let's go maybe one five. And the, the lower you put this number, obviously the more it will uh, compute and take to, uh, to generate. But now look at the detail we have now. It's super nice. And this is exactly what I want. It's super chipped up and this will give a nice look in the refraction. Um, one thing though, you will see that the mesh is extremely dense and that is something which you don't necessarily need. Um, this node doesn't support what I want to do now. At least I didn't find it. 
Um, and what I want to do all the way at the bottom of this, um, where we go down, oh, so where we actually generate the um, the poly from this, which is convert VDB, and this node is generating the the the, the polygons. You'll see that this adapted ad adaptivity is not exposed, and I'm not sure exactly why they didn't do this. In the end, what it does, it will really reduce the um, point count, like the resolution of the mesh. You can see we now have uh, 1.5 mil. If I go maybe a little bit more, uh, you will see we won't lose any detail on the on the high frequency stuff. But now already we are on 760,000, so half, roughly half of what we had initially. Um, these are a little bit concerning, these edges. Maybe they will cause some problems in the render. But we will see. So now we are on point one. We can compute normals if they are messed up, but they I think they should be good. And then obviously you can go out and you should have your final look. Uh, and that is that. All right, next up, we are going back to our reference. And uh, you'll notice that I said before, the bottom piece is a different, it feels like it's a different uh, material. Obviously it's not, but it's just, um, it's more broken up as if, as if it's shattered or it, it hasn't been polished or whatever, right? So you see that it's super coarse and then um, it's, it's definitely more broken up here than it is, um, let's say, at the upper half. Um, simple thing, um, you can do this with displacement in the shader, um, but I like to kind of now working in Houdini, I like to be kind of visual. Um, probably if I would be working in Maya straight up, I would just um, probably would just start working with um, the, this basic shape and do most of the things in the shader. But I love the detail I'm getting with these nodes. So this is obviously super nice. Um, so as I said, now I want to break up, let's say the lower piece. Um, and I will do a very similar thing as I just did before. And this will be um, creating a mountain, a mask, and then just driving it with an attribute, right? So if I create a mountain, um, I like to use that node because it's it's very versatile um, and it has lots of little nice little features. Um, again, I want to reduce the size and I want to reduce the element size and then probably increase the amplitude a little. And uh, yeah, play around until I have the desired look I want to go for. So you could see I was switching between the noise along vector and not, but I think this is kind of what I want to go for. Um, we don't have enough detail still. So the remesh at the top, I will go a little bit lower still on the target size. I reduce this by half, so we get a lot more points. We are now at uh, 60,000 points, and now we have the super high detail here. Um, and this is kind of what I want because I will be reducing the overall effect um, using masks as well. So we can, first of all, reduce the amplitude so we don't get these intersections. And then, again, play a little bit more with the, all of this. Yeah, this is now getting better because we are going over um, the, the broader shape. And using the gradient warp, you get these kind of ridges. And I really enjoy this because this is, it feels quite organic to have these weird um, cracks in here. And you can kind of see similar patterns in the rock itself. So I really like this look. And that's, I, I don't really know what it, the math is doing behind the scenes, but I just like the result. So I'm just sliding values until I get something I really like to see. And, and I think this is kind of going where I wanted to go. Uh, you can also, again, try with the normals and not. Even without the normals now, this feels even better because it looks very organic now. Or uh, essentially like a rock with these little ridges and whatnot. And then you can, again, play with the offset. Let's look through the render cam and then offset it until we have a, a good thing, which, uh, which we like to use. Um, again, you can play as much as you want. So I think this breaks up the silhouette nicely. So I don't want to have it at the top, right? Um, so this mountain has a blend value. You can see I can blend it in and you can drive it with an attribute. The attribute defaults to mask. Um, again, we can paint it or you can use um, some math. I just paint it because it's, it will be like a one-off anyways. So attribute paint, 
uh, we are painting on the mask. And if I now, let's say, draw something, let's see what, what did we get? We get the noise within, right? So if I paint, we get the noise. So uh, I can now have it um, to just paint throughout. this so this is now what we have and you can kind of see it kind of works we do need to blend it a little bit more so you can do an attribute blur if you want so it's just called attribute blur and you want to blur the mask and if i look through this now let's see the mask and we can now blur it and you get a really soft uh, result depends how strong you want to blur it obviously um, but this is roughly the idea So I'm quite happy with this result. So let's just um, pipe that whole thing back to our next noise, which is um, let's we can colorize this section. So this is now a green section. And now we are distorting the whole thing again, as we did before. Um, our paint masks are probably now messed up. Yeah, they are. So first I want to delete the previous ramp. So I just do an attribute delete just to clean out um, the previous mask we had. Uh, so it's not interfering. And now this should be gone. Now I can paint again, but you will see now this is totally messed up. So you can go to recache, recache strokes, and you should be good again. And then edge damage. So this will take some time because it will voxelize it and then bring it back. And now we do have a pretty nice uh, geo, which has edge damage. Let's maybe do purple. And which has these weird patterns, obviously, if it's too much, I think this is a bit much, but um, you will see we get all the same stuff we had before. Um, all right, so this is what we have now. Um, let me save this, go up a level, and let's render this and see, first of all, what we get from our original simple shape to a more defined, detailed crystal shape. See now, um, it's quite noisy. So um, first thing, go back to our um, ROP. I like to denoise it, so we have still a very clean render, but we have it a lot faster. So I can use for, for the current render I'm using, you can use uh, the imagers and you can use a uh, imager denoiser. So just hook it up. That's all you have to do. I like that. And in the crystal render node, um, you will see there is this imager thing whenever, wherever I find it, it's down here. So I just drag this in here and that's all you have to do. But I will also increase the, um, camera A samples, and I will also increase the transmission to two. And I will go back to object level. I will increase the samples on my Skydome. Save again and hit render. And now we have an imager. And again, Redshift, V-Ray, and all of them, they should have very similar things. Redshift now supports the standard surface model as well. So shading wise, you should be very much on par with, uh, with Arnold. And yeah, so this is the denoise result. Right, so now from the basic shaded model, let's go into a little bit more detail. So um, first of all, I want to go one more time back into the geo node here. And in here, I want to create a curvature. So it's also a labs node, which is called, I think, labs, labs measure curvature. And I wanted to have it all um, at the bottom here. And this node is pretty nice um, because it calculates surface detail um, and bakes it as a geo. You can use this in the shader as well, but the shader will be um, more heavy to use. It will be slower. So if you can bake it, you should do it. And this again is probably a, a could be a problematic because now we reduce the surface detail. So um, one thing in the edge damage here, I, I use the um, that adaptivity. So maybe just reduce this to 0.1. Let's see what we have now. So 1 million points. We have a little bit more detail, so let's roll with that and see what we get. Um, yeah, so now we can go into the intensity of the convexity and increase that. Now we should definitely see more details in here. And this just helps, and we can use this in the shader, so this is super nice. Um, and then we can use the same for the concavity, maybe 10. And we should see now more green, which is like the inverse. You can see now we have a little bit more green. 
And um, let's see, can I maybe even more increase this? Yeah, so now we have strong green and we've got strong red. Pretty cool. And I don't want to see it. Um, I just want to bake it. So right now, these are the attribute names. So I'll just call this one quite simply um, edges. And at the bottom one, I could just call this uh, cracks. And one last thing, I want to calculate the height. Um, I know this is in zero and one space. It's kind of uh, um, normalized, but I still want to um, know the height. Imagine if it's a larger object, I want to kind of have it automatic. But um, attribute wrangle, it's a little bit of a coding thing, but I can just call it calculate height, quite straightforward. And all we do honestly, is we just create a parameter called height. And all we say is the current point, um, take the y value, so the second input, uh, second value of p, and just pipe that into height. And p is obviously an xyz coordinate of every point um, on the mesh, right? So I've got tons of points, each point has a coordinate xyz. I want to grab this point and save the vertical attribute on the vertex point height attribute. And in a spreadsheet, you will see now we have height. And you will see that it goes from um, 0 to 0.9. And if the object will be taller, it will go obviously higher, this number. I can also visualize it if I um, view from here and control middle click and hit height, you'll see that it is colorized. Pretty, right? And I can use this to drive certain things in the shader, which is also very helpful. And now that I talked so much, I want to now go into the shader and use those attributes to drive the look. Um, all right, so now let's go into the matte context. Um, I do have it in here. So it's, I have like a separate split view, which is super helpful because I can deal with both at the same time. So this is right now the base and we can keep working in the base because we just have this one material. So I'm quite happy to just keep using this. Um, so in here, as I said, we do want to read those attributes at some point. So it calls cracks, edges, and height. So I'm using a user data float, and the attribute name will be $OS. And this is just my way of working. So my node name will be the attribute name. So you can obviously do a user data float and rename this to edges, which is which you can do. But now it's a bit hard to see um, from the top level what this is not doing. All right, so I'm just alt dragging and renaming this to edges, alt dragging, renaming this to uh, cracks. And now we have these three attributes. They are float data. So if I would now, um, let's see if my little thing works. No, it doesn't work anymore. Shame. Um, anyways, if I now connect the output of this, I'm not sure why I can't expand this, to this and render, you should now see our attribute and we see something. It's uh, a gradient, right? Because that is our height. Um, we also have edges. Let's see, let's visualize those. We see those edges and the cracks will look very similar, but a little bit offset, right? If I plug that in, we have the edges too. Um, so this is what we have. And now let's get going. If I connect the shader back up, this is obviously our basic material. And the first thing what I want to do, I want to disable the roughness. I want to disable um, the color. You can also just kill the base. So now we just have a spec super shiny specular surface. But then again, I also want to delete the specular component um, what, because um, if I want to have the crystal to be rough looking like this, this will directly affect the transmission value, meaning um, we get a sandblasted look, which I don't want because as you can see the ref, it's pretty clear only at the bottom it's not. Um, but this is technically um, a little bit of a different thing. It's kind of like a volume or a fog inside, which we'll get to. But uh, you wanted a step-by-step -step tutorial, so this is because uh, this is now a step-by-step -step tutorial. Um, so roughness zero, specular zero. And now you would wonder, but it is reflective, so what do you do? So I'm kind of cheating. I'm ignoring the specular lobe within the shader and I'm compensating that with the coat, which is technically incorrect because it is not a dual lobe 
material, it's a single lobe, but I'm disabling the specular on the specular lobe and just using the code. So technically it's the same because they both are additive and nothing really changes the look. The benefit is I can change the roughness independently and it will not affect the transmission roughness, which is the main thing why I do this. Um, and different shader system like a Llama surface shader, a Llama shading network for Random Man, you can obviously customize your shaders or you can create an OSL shader or whatnot. All right, so we've got our reflectivity back, which looks like this. We've got an IOF of 1.6. We probably have crystals are higher, probably 1.6 to 1.8. So uh, 1.8, it will be a little bit more kind of metallic-y looking. You will see it's a lot more shiny now. Um, and we don't have transmission. So if I enable this, we get this, which is now translucent. But it's not really what I would be expecting. So let me um, debug this. So one thing I just noticed and forgot to change in the edge damage, uh, because it is voxelizing the mesh, you will see that um, it has like an inside. So it has actually a physical thickness to it. And uh, this is something I don't want. I want to have a solid object. So uh, in the edge damage, you have this extract largest piece. Um, and then once you do that, you will only have this inside piece. So it's not, it's not, it's now a single sided geo. And this is roughly uh, more accurate what I want. And then again, we still do the same stuff. Um, so nothing else changed. So we still have our attribute and everything uh, working as we would expect it. And now if I render, we get now this more translucent object. And it is very broken up here at the bottom because we have um, by default this bottom noise. Um, if I would disable our two noises, or at least just the top, um, the top two mountains, and if I would render this now, you should definitely see it's a lot cleaner. It looks like a clear crystal. And you can see it's now reflecting everything as we would expect it to. And this is quite accurate. So um, what I did before, um, I was breaking up um, the look so much that it affected the roughness, which is normal, which is exactly what we want. I just wanted to show that this works without the noise. So now let's deal with the shader stuff, right? So um, we are back at this. So if I render this now, we have height, edges, and cracks, which is great. So um, let's say I want to adjust the roughness on um, the edges, for instance, right? So uh, all I can do now is use these edges. And um, these are obviously range from zero to one. And if I have a roughness map, I could then plug this in edges. So Right, so zero and one. If I plug this in directly into the code um, roughness, um, this will now affect it. So if I look at the code um, indirect, uh, sorry, the code direct, you should see now our edges are definitely more broken up. And again, I can visualize this through the surface node. Um, and then if you go to color, you can see this is what the map looks like. I always use a range to control the amount. So if I plug this in, like this, and this goes in here. And if you want to see it as well, we hook up the other one. And now I can make sure it's smooth stepped, so it means it's it's clamped. So now I can uh, reduce the input max, so more of the values are being set to one, and now it's super strong. Everything else is on zero, right? And again, if I want to see the shader, I just plug that in, and now we should have a very strong roughness here. Uh, uh, only at these edges here. So it will be hard to see, but once it's moving, you can see it a lot stronger. Um, so next up, what I like to do um, is kind of use a similar technique for the bump map. So I have this height, and I want to use the height to drive a bump control. Um, and a bump map, I just want to use a noise. And by default, um, I just plug this into a bump 2D. And let's hook it up like RGB goes to bump map, vector goes this time to code normal and to geo normal, which is here. So we have it in two pieces. And now if I visualize, you can already see the node, uh, the noise is doing stuff. It's really breaking up the normals and it's now super rough looking. Um, if I change the size, you will get very small and fine details. And again, I always like to visualize my nodes so I see what I'm doing. And this is what it is right now. You can also just run a region, shift, click, and drag. And if I increase the scale maybe to uh, 80, one, uh, sorry, to 190, 
I can also add more details, more octaves, gives me more high frequency detail. And this will this should now mimic this uh, super fine structure here, like these smaller cracks and bumps and whatnot. Maybe we need to add more distortion so it's a little bit more organic and probably reduce our overall scale to maybe 120. Something like this looks a little bit better, maybe even more. 60 is a too, too large. Like this, let's leave it like that. And as I said, we want to control this now with this height because I don't want it to be everywhere. Or it would be everywhere. Um, we wouldn't see um, through the crystal. You will see now it's uh, completely uh, broken up like this. And this is obviously not the look. Um, but I want to use the height to control it. And it's quite easy to do. You could also do this in the shader using a state vector um, position and extract the vertical one and use that. But again, um, it would be based on the shader and be a little bit slower. Um, so now I can just use a multiply node, um, plug the result of the height in, let's say, input one. I want to control it. So I use a range, plug that into the input. This goes in here, and then I want to control the bump height with this. So right now, if I plug this in here, bump height, um, this is now a range from zero to one, and it will multiply a value of one with zero to one. So it should already fade off. Um, if I reduce the overall bump strength, let's go maybe 0.1. It's probably, it won't be that visible yet because it's still quite strong and we still need to adjust our range. So again, I am hooking this up. So I can see, actually, I just want to see the range and you will see it at the bottom it's zero. So I want to obviously flip it so I can just do zero and one to change it. So now it's fading off towards the top and now I can just play with the height and make sure smooth stepping is on. And now I can say, okay, it's fully on at the bottom and then it's just kind of fading towards the top. Um, I don't want it to be a straight line like it is now. I want it to be some kind of a nice, organic shape again. I keep saying organic because this is kind of how nature is. It's very random. So that's why I use noises all the time. And you can see now in my range, I'm working with 6.4. If I slide the 6.4, maybe up goes to 6.7. And at the lower case, it goes maybe to 5.5. So let's go 5.5 five to 6.7 or whatever is my range I want to work with. So if I plug this noise into my input max, this obviously goes now from zero to one. I want to change this um, to the numbers I just said. So um, 0 0.55 and 0 0.67. This is my working range. And now it would just be about playing with the scale. And now see we have some kind of breakup already. It's now way too small. I can add distortion to this um, and maybe reduce the size. And now see we already have this kind of rowing pattern you can play with the amplitude to create some more interesting bump effects um, again this is up to your interpretation what you want to do with this but this is kind of breaking up um, the bump strength and if i now um, look at the uh, the render at the top it should be off you can see it is off uh, but it's super strong obviously at the bottom um, now it comes into playing with my overall strength so i can reduce this and you will see that it gets less and less and it can go really low, maybe 0.1, and it's fading off more and more. And if it's too high, which I think it is, um, all you have to do now, as I said, the range was on 0.67 or so, we can go lower. We can now go maybe, uh, let's go three and four. And now you'll see it, it move all the way down till here. So we probably want to go um, up to five, which is half of the distance. And I think I now still think that my overall um, bump is too, uh, my overall breakup is too strong. Um, but these things uh, we will be adjusting anyways. And we don't have the cracks yet. So I just want to um, combine these for now. So I'll just use a max operation. Max will take the biggest value from the inputs. So it's not additive, it will just take the higher value. And if I plug this in now, we should also see a breakup in, in these edges in there as well. Um, all right, so um, this was the first step for the shading. We'll obviously go a lot deeper into shading uh, this crystal. Now I broke something, there we go. Um, but yeah, this is the first step and you can see how we go along.
All right, so now that we have the basic look acquired, so I think we need to work a little bit more on the um, roughness of the, of the um, crystal itself. It looks very clean. So um, I'm just pasting here an image node um, pointing to a location on disk. And I wanna make sure it's utility raw. I wanna create the TX files for it. And then um, if I just connect this right straight off um, to the surface material, you kind of see like we don't have UV, so everything is not really working. So I always, um, for this, these kind of um, cases, I'm using the triplanar. It's uh, essentially a projection UV mapping in X, Y, and Z coordinates. And you just connect it into the um, input of the triplanar and hook it out to the RGB. And then you can already see um, things are working. And this already looks pretty well. I think I just want to increase the frequency of the of the um, scatter itself, of the um, repetition of the texture, I mean, um, just to get a little bit more. And then if you use cell, it kind of creates copies of this texture and rotates it. And you can specify the rotate rotation angle. And it just helps to create a more randomized organic pattern. And um, I like just doing that because it, it kind of increases the resolution of the texture um, by just um, blending it together and, and sorts like this. So it's, it's quite nice. It's a nice technique I use quite often. Um, the next thing I just want to do then is to adjust the range so it's a little bit more contrasty and uh, we get something from it a little bit more interesting. And you can see that in the render itself. As soon as it starts rotating, you will have different um, roughness um, values and it looks quite nice. So if I connect this up to the range, and again, as I said, I do want to contrast it a little bit. I do want to make the white stronger. Um, so I'm just reducing this maybe to half of this. Make sure that smooth stepping is on, as I always do. Um, and this already now gives me a nice crunch. So the blacks will be very reflective and the whites will be super rough looking. And I just don't want to um, have my maximum roughness at one. So I probably want to go at 8.5 or, or 9 or something to just have a little bit of uh, some wriggle room because nothing is super rough like a value of one. Um, yeah, and this will go into the code roughness as we do not use specular. Um, you can see I do already have something in the roughness, which is my um, edges and cracks. So what I want to do, um, I probably don't want to use this for um, the edges because edges, if they are broken up, they're mostly um, more reflective because it's a clean crack. And then I just wanna plug that into here. So right now we do not have anything, um, no breakup on these edges, but I still wanna kind of have them affect something. But first let's look um, if we see a difference now with the specular, uh, with the code roughness. If I look at the code, um, direct you should see now we get these this nice broken up look here and i still think that my bump map might be too strong so we can reduce this even further so now it's half of what we had before and we should now see a little bit more detail all over um, the next thing what i want to work on is um, breaking up the bump map even more as you can see again if you look at the render you will see that it has these distinct horizontal lines and this is something I want to replicate as well, right? So um, as I said, I want to use a noise for this and just a regular one. And I always like to visualize my noise first before I plug them in. So this is currently the noise. We don't see anything because we are in code. So if I go to see, this is what we have, a really low scale. And then one of the axes is a very high scale. And this already should help me to stretch things out. You can see now we get these lines. That actually was super straightforward to do. Um, what we want to do maybe is break up the lines a little bit using the distortion here. This will help to just get a little bit more breakup. Um, because it's still super stretched, um, it won't be that visible because we are stretching it by a factor of 50. Um, so what I like to do, which is um, there are probably tons of different ways to do it, but uh, how noises work there based on point position, right? So it's a grid, this is an object space, so each point has a um, certain coordinate assigned to it. And if I bring in the state vector, this is something you can use, um, and internally the noise uses that too, not the state vector itself, but um, the P here. So if you've got the object space, world position, um, and this is driving, this is kind of this P 
value which is built in into this noise. But so if I plug this in here, um, nothing is really changing. It's just the same value. What I want to do with this p value though, instead of just having it um, go in, I want to distort this p value. And I'm using a multiply operation. And I, I want to plug the state vector into input two. And now I want to use another noise. And this noise will multiply um, the, the position. And make sure that you set the mode from scalar to vector. So it's a um, 3D noise instead. Plug that in. And if I hook this up to um, P, you should now see it's weirdly broken up. And, and this is now how I am controlling the breakup of this noise. I can add more details to it. So it is a higher breakup pattern. You can see you get quite organic rock shapes now. Or like you get these kind of almost fluid-like look from, from, these, um, from these breakups. And again, you can increase the scale. So it's, it's more repetitive. So it's a higher frequency. Maybe something like this. And then um, you can play with the distortion. And I just want them obviously horizontal. I don't want them to be this broken up. So after this, I like to control it again with um, the intensity of this. So that my multiplication will be a lot less. And I just, this is a way for me, I can control it. So um, instead of going into the noise, again, I'm using a range here to control the intensity of the multiplication. So I put this in here, the out goes into the RGB, and now I can com control the intensity, the amplitude of this noise, this vector with the state vector. So all I gotta do um, is increase my output min, which means whatever the input vectors, I'll just multiply it with one, because uh, one times one is one, so no change. And if I really um, reduce this very subtle, the input min, you can see now we have a very subtle breakup in these horizontal lines. Obviously, this already is too much. So maybe go 9.8, uh, 0.98. You can now see we get these kind of nice little broken up edges. It's probably a bit too much still. Um, so let's just go even more so it's not super strong. And something like this, I think, could work. We can go even one more step to just straighten out these lines. And if, and if you feel like you... Um, you don't want to have any noise or any bump, you can also increase the minimum values. And this should also um, kind of limit the, uh, sorry, you, you can also do a, a range after with this noise here to limit the overall effect. Um, so let me just get that range going so we can have a bit more influence. So it's not bumpy all the way, but it's just bumpy in, um, in a certain region. So if I go maybe like 0.4, so you will see that we will only have bumps now where the value is brighter than, uh, bigger than zero. So that being said, we have this nice bump map now, and I want to combine it with my previous bump map. So technically we can do like a, um, say a backdrop, but we can um, do this, what do they call it here? A network box around it so we can see actually what's going on. So this is one network box, this is another one, and we want to combine these bumps. So um, this bump is my main one, and I want to create a bump 2D like that. And I want to hook it up. So my output color goes into the map and this vector goes into the normal here. <clears throat> and if we now visualize the render, if I go and hook this up to my surface. So now it is the shader we are seeing. You can now see we get the strong horizontal lines. And again, as I said before, um, way too strong because the defaults in H2A and Houdini are very high for the bump map. I think in Maya it's 0 0.01. So let's go maybe 001 and maybe also visualize the code direct and maybe just have a little region here and so we can evaluate it a lot nicer. You can see these lines look fairly close to these lines. We are maybe uh, still a little bit too strong on the pattern but it definitely looks like this. So we can try 05. So we have a little less influence and this already is pretty good. So now let's uh, visualize the beauty. You can see now we get these nice horizontal lines and you might say it doesn't add much to it uh, or it doesn't see so, it doesn't look so different, but I think in motion you will quite clearly see um, the look.
And you can also multiply this with our noise here. So it's only at the top or only at the bottom. So again, this is up to you how you want to um, deal with this. But I think it's nice to have it all around and the bottom will break it up anyway. So you won't really notice it at the bottom. Um, one last thing now is let's work a little bit on the material. Right now it's just glass see-through. So I like to play with these um, scatter values and you, you can only use scatter if you have some depth applied to this. And if your transmission is on one, um, you probably do want to have a little bit of a color um, for the material. I like to go um, probably a little bit on the blue side, um, but it's, it's you can have a red crystal or you don't, you can have a fully clear crystal as well. It's absolutely, you'll call what you want to do with um, the basic base color here. Um, and it's very subtle. And now if I would have a super low depth value, you will see that it's getting super saturated. Um, let me just put scatter to zero. Um, if I, oh, I did, did it on the wrong, wrong spectrum here. So if I go to this one, make it blue value, and then like this, you will see now we get a very saturated crystal. And this is because our depth value is very low. Um, if I increase this, it will get less saturated. See, now it's kind of a blue crystal. And this is now controllable. And uh, obviously, it's a little bit high, my, my saturation in general. Um, and, and this is how you can control it. And, and I think a value of um, maybe 0 0.01 or so is appropriate for this. It's a little, a little super light blue. It's barely visible. And the only thing I want to do now is play with the scattering. So if you can see now, if I have a value around one-ish, or let's say at 0.5, you'll see it looks like a super smoky crystal. Something like this, uh, a very smoky kind of look. And I want to use this to control some of the discolorization here at the bottom. So um, this is something I want to play with as well. So I do have my height here. So all of these, I, I technically want to use those to drive the scattering um, affect the value of this. So if I connect a max node and I just use the output of this, the concoction I had here, I use this as my input one and then I use the edges and cracks I had before. So edges are the outside lines and cracks are the these broken up pieces. So maybe I just use the cracks for now and, and max these two together and my current value is 0 0.5 I multiply this, let me think, uh, maxing is a zero and one value. It, I need to multiply this with um, my 0 0.5, which is the scatter value I had in here. And if I now use the max and hook it up to input one, and the output goes um, into the transmission scatter, we should only see something in the bottom and in, in those cracked regions. And if I visualize again, the texture itself, the raw texture, you will see that we only have um, some scattering down below here and the rest is clear, which you would see in here as well. So it's clear for the most part, but then at the bottom, it kind of gets smoky. And, and again, this is driven by our original height concoction we have, plus the cracks here. You can also max in the edges if you want to. Um, again, it's up to you but it's a possibility. So now we have this kind of smoky feeling at the bottom and the more broken up ridges and edges here at the top. All right, so next up, we want to do the volumetric stuff, right? Um, there are two ways of doing this. Um, one is a lot more successful than the other one, but I just want to show you why that is. So the first thing what I want to do, um, I just want to rename this R&D R group right now, just because my system automatically picks, doesn't pick it up if it's not called uh, starting with R&D R. So uh, what I want to do, I want to copy this node. Again, I'm using the OD tool set, so it, it has a lot of convenience tools. It automatically creates me this uh, geo node with a object merge within. I just want to call it R&D R uh, crystal, and I call this um, geo volume. And what I want to do with this, you see it's just an object merge within. And Arnold 
and probably all other renders has the option to convert a geo to a volume surface. And you have to do that in, or you can do that on the object settings per geo. And if you go to um, the shapes, volumes, you can change the volume step size. You can see um, points and poly meshes are rendered as volumes if the step size is bigger than zero. So if I put a one in here, um, it expects a volume shader, which you don't have yet. So I'm just creating an on node material here at the top. And I just call this um, geo volume shader. Jump in here and create a standard volume shader. And if I hook this up, you would you should see a density appearing. So if I assign the material to it, Matt, and I'm not sure why it doesn't show up here. That's weird. So let's just type it in geo volume, and then you will see it will um, show up. And if I now go to the render tab and hit render, you should now see that we have some kind of volume appearing here super faint so all we have to do now is just increase the density maybe let's go up to 50 and now we should start seeing things um so the next step is to kind of break it up so you can use the density slot or the displacement and if you want to go for more realistic you would like to use the displacement and let's just use a noise um <clears throat> a 2d approach which is a default for noises won't really work so you would need to change the mode from scalar to vector also you would need to change the working range for this noise from negative one to positive one this is a, a a step you have to do to get um displacement working and if you hook this up to the displacement slot um, you won't see much because in our object mode on the object settings where we enabled the volume step size you would also need to add some volume padding which kind of expands the box you can now see the stuff is all over the place and if I change um, the amplitude, maybe to 0 0.01 or something, you kind of see that we have it back, but it's not really that big. Um, so this is one way of, of breaking it up. And if I change maybe the amplitude to 0.1, you can kind of see it, it's getting um, very distorted. Yeah, and you can see now it's really broken up. The thing though is, if you use displacement, um, there's, there's also another way, actually. Let me show you the other way of doing this. If you just create a different noise pattern and you um, leave it at zero, 0 to 1, keep it in a vector space, and then you create a vector map like that. And if you hook that up, you can um, do, you have like a scale attribute here, which helps a little bit to control the um, intensity. Um, for this to work, you would need to change color to signed. That means it will normalize the inputs and disable the tangent space. So technically, all I'm doing is following um, basic steps to create a displacement value. And you will see now um, it's kind of creating this displacement here. Um, but as I said in the beginning, um, this is not very ideal for what I want to work with just because um, I want to have control over exactly what I'm doing. And with, with a shaded approach, it's super tricky to do. And especially if you follow the tutorial from Lee Griggs, um, if you apply displacement, there's no way to keep it within the boundaries of the crystal. Um, it will always go outside and inside of this. So some will be in here, but then others will go outside. And this is what we want to avoid. And there's no way in the sense where you have a physical volume where you can control or limit the, the space. Not, 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 not at least that I know of. Probably if you know some custom OSL or whatever, you can totally do it. Um, so this is the approach I tested first, but I am abandoning it quite quickly. So um, I'll just keep the material, standard volume. So if I render again, we should have the solid object, which we have here. But now I just want to disable the volumes altogether. And I just want to call this uh, volume because this is what we will be doing in the end crystal, render crystal volume, and how it, I want to set it up, I want to um, create a new geo context. I'll just copy this one again, the out geo, and I control paste it in here. And this will be my geo volume. And I'm doing this just that I have a clean working space for my geometry, my, my, my geo. So I'm using this last location here and going into the volume. And in here, we will now create some very interesting um, shapes of this, right? This is our starting point. And right now this is a geo, so it won't, um, it won't run as a volume. 
And what I want to do here is also create this out volume. This will be my last node. So if I copy this location and I go back into my crystal volume, I want to use this one instead now. So now whenever I ren render this, this context here, run the crystal volume, um, it will actually render the volume itself. All right, so now let's get going with what we want to achieve. So if you look at the ref, we kind of have this pattern um, doing something like this, right? So, and, and you have maybe a little bit of clouds here and here and here. So we kind of want to replicate that. And you can also see in the red one, you have a similar thing. Um, it's not that apparent. It doesn't break up so much. It's mainly just a smoother shape, but it still has a, the kind of similar properties. So I'm converting the geo to a VDB. So VDB from poly, meaning it's measuring the distance. It's returning a, a distance um, to the surface of this object. So if I reduce my voxel size maybe to 0.01, you can see we have a very more detailed appearance to it. And what I want to do, um, you can rename this um, in the in the point vop field or whatever, but you can also just rename the distance VDB to density. This will allow you to do a point VOP, a uh, volume operation um, context. So in this volume VOP, it's essentially a visual coding playground. And if I dive in here, so what I was saying, you can do the volume bindings and you can, um, you can bind each to density and do it manually. But this, if you just rename the field to density, you don't have to do anything and it will just work. And if I view this node, if I go in here, you will see you have a density in and density out. And this is visual coding, essentially. In the end, it's a VEX code, and I don't want to do a volume wrangle or whatever, so we will just be using the volume bop. So a quick introduction to STFs. I'm not an expert by no means, um, but I just want to show you roughly how it works. So if you have a geometry like, a, like this crystal, you will have a surface level here and what an stf is doing it's just measuring the distance to to this to the surface so if you have a value which is outside of the surface it will be a um, negative value let's say minus one and minus two uh that was not two minus two minus three and on the inside you have positive numbers so this would be plus one plus two plus three, and this will be the distance. And then on the other side, this will go back to plus two, um, plus one, and then the surface, and then it will be negative one, negative two to this side. This is how it works. And this is how, how you can control it. So if I would have something now, a noise pattern, where I'm adding a value to it, let's say a, a noise which is going from zero to one, and this is the noise from a side view, if I would add let's say 0.1 to the surface here, the surface would kind of be pushed inside because you're changing where the new surface will be with a value of 0.1. If the noise is going maybe to a value of two, um, then the new surface will be down here and it will go to, to two, right? Um, and you, if you have a negative value for the noise, it's kind of the opposite. So um, if this is zero, the surface, and you add a negative value to it, the surface will push out like this. And if you have a bigger negative value, it will push out even further. And this was quite helpful for me, um, explained by uh, Swalch from the CG Wiki. They also have a Discord server. Um, and he helped me to understand how the, the principles of this work. So it helped me a lot to get this going as well. So I have the density field. And if I just use an AA noise, which is a basic simple noise, um, it, it expects a position of, of a, a, to calculate its noise in general. And if I would add this to my density field, which we currently have, which is the surface, uh, the SDF, and I add it, you will see now that my noise kind of disappears. Reason is, um, in our volume VOP, we, uh, in our VDB from polys, we did not fill the interior. So once you fill it, you can now see we have more things going on. And another thing which we have to do <clears throat> we have to expand our voxels. Right now, we are just 0.03 units um, pushing our initial um, voxel grid to the outside, which is this. So if you have more noise, it will kind of be broken up. So if we increase this, maybe to 0.1, we'll see that the bounds are expanded and we should now have a bigger region of interest here. 
So these values here all are uh, ranging from zero to one, which means the surface will be kind of pushed inside quite aggressively. If I do a fit range, I can say by how much I want to um, increase those numbers. Obviously the fit needs to be um, before we add everything together. So the fit should go in here. So now um, if I reduce it, reduce the density max, I, I'm not adding anything to it. And you can see now we have our original shape back. And if I reduce this a little bit, you can see now um, it's shrinking because our value is going closer to one, which means the surface is being pushed inside. And this is exactly what is happening, right? And knowing this, we can now play around with several noises. We can um, really control the look and feel of what we want to achieve. And if you want to have more noises, you can stack them together. I could create now a different noise and I could add these two together, um, something like this. Um, adding them and then doing this. So now we have a completely different noise, which we can offset in a completely different direction and uh, play with roughness values and whatever, right? You, you get the idea um, like that. And if you wanna look on the outside now, which is this one, in the end, we want to convert this back um, to a, um, we want to convert the STF to a, actually to a volume. So we would do a convert VDB like this. And we want to convert it to a VDB, which it is already, but we want to change the class from STF to a FOC, which will give us um, this very faint um, sort of smoke in the viewport. And one last thing, I want to create a volume wrangle. And simple vex, nothing crazy. I just want to make the density feel stronger. So density uh, times equals 100 um, should give us a more visual representation in the viewport. If I can type density correct, it should help. There we go. So now we see a volume field in the viewport and this is just quite helpful to control everything. So now I will be diving in here into this network and I will be playing until I'm satisfied with the results. One thing I want to do now, you will see that the noise is also affecting the lower regions here, which I don't want. I typically want it to be fully um, thick at the bottom. And the thing you can play around with with the offset so much, but it's, it will be a little bit hard to, to get it right. Um, so what I always like to do, there's a little trick. You can use a relative bounding box. Um, which it's essentially just grabbing in the position of your input and then it's outputting a vector. And I want to um, extract the height, so the vertical position um, from this vector. So vector goes into the vector to float, and then we have X, Y, and Z. And I just want to extract the Z component. And this allows me to kind of specify how strong or where, where exactly I want to have an effect. So um, it should go from zero to one. So if I would add, just to visualize it, the original density, and I would add, did that work? No, that was the wrong one. Density, input one, and I would add the Y axis to this density field. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work, so maybe we should do a fit. Um, and let's see what we get now. Yeah, you, you will see that the top is being affected a lot more than the bottom. And if I clamp these in, you will see that now we have a very thick base and just the top is shrinking. So this is now the region I can kind of control where I want um, this noise to work. And now what it means is that the top is positive because it, the surface is being pushed in and the bottom is um, zero. So nothing gets added at the bottom. And you can control this again with this source min, and you can obviously really make it straight, really clamp it in. So now this is like a multiplication field. And if I just want to control it with, uh, let's say I want to do both noises for now, just to show you, um, you will now see that the noise is affecting the whole thing. And if I would do a multiply after the something, 
And as I said, the vector field which we created is from zero and one. And if I would multiply these two together and add them, you will now see that the bottom is not really um, affected much anymore. It's just the top which is broken up. Obviously, we would like to um, have, no, actually, we, we do want it like that. We just want to have it not so strong or not on both of these um, noises. I just want it on the bottom because I, I, I like the, if I just visualize the top noise, it's actually pretty nice. It's solid at the bottom, but at the top, it's uh, it's breaking up, which is great. But this once we add the second one to it, we also eat away from the bottom piece. So I want to use the second one to multiply um, with my little height field, which we created. And instead of adding um, just these two, right, let's actually colorize them so it, it makes more sense. So this is my first one. This will be my uh, second one. And this is my height field, which I make green because it's a y-axis field. So I'm multiplying these two together. And then I'm adding that to this. And now you can clearly see that the bottom is not affected by the noise too, by the brown noise, but only um, the top region. And again, I can play with the fit and say how strong or where exactly I want um, the bottom region to be affected. I hope this makes sense. Um, if not, I can maybe do a live session about it and go into more detail. And now I will just continue uh, to keep moving and I'll create some interesting patterns here. have some kind of breakup and this is the first pass I want to see how it would look when it's rendered. So we have the output volume which is as I said goes into straight into the um, the crystal volume pass here and this should have a shader assigned if I'm not mistaken. It has a geo volume which is yeah which should be fine. So if I go to render view and render let's see what we get. We get some kind of shape and it looks pretty close to what we were seeing in the viewport, which is perfect. So if I visualize uh, this guy, um, come on, there we go. So that's the viewport thing. And this is the rendered result. And obviously in the shader itself, because it was the previous shader we uh, were working on, I did um, really crank up the density to 50. So if I go back to one, this is um, now what we should see in the viewport. So this is quite close to, to that. So now let's render this and the crystal together. And now we just rename the R and the R to the proper thing. And this again will now render no matter what is displayed, like the display flex don't matter. It's whatever is called R and R <clears throat> that will be rendered. Nothing is visible. If I hit render now, we should hopefully see um, this pattern within. And yeah, we definitely see the, the volume within here. And this is great. Um, you can see it's all the way up in the top here. This is because of refraction, our um, glass material. Let's see what we have for an um, index of refraction on this one. Um, we do have 1.5 and typically it's higher for crystals. So we can see how it looks on maybe 1.8. So this will be refracted even stronger. So we should see um, the rays being separated further. And then also our um, color. Let's see what we have on the geo volume. It's a pretty close white. Uh, we can also play around with the depth if needed. Um, but one um, contributing thing is that the lighting depth, the render depth. So if we would go to the uh, render edit render node, which is our global render settings, um, I can go into the the ray depth section, and I could increase maybe the volume ray depth to two. Let's see what that brings us. And just by doing that, we are pushing a lot more light in the volume. It will render slower, 
but this is the more realistic uh, look um, based on what our shader is now representing. We, because we are saying it should look white and now it kind of does look white. And this is roughly the idea. So if you want to, um, probably a depth of one is good enough for this case, then it is a little bit less white, but it's um, a bit faster to render. And, and now it just comes about fine tuning everything, dialing things in, making the smoke more interesting. If you would see in the, in the speed up I did, I was adjusting the VDB at some point, and this just allowed me to give me more details in the final rendered volume. And you will see, if I go to the VDB from Polys, uh, we are on 005, and it's not super detailed, it's still quite coarse actually. So we can try 001, which is a lot more details now. So this will take some time to generate the VDB. So this takes some time, but now you can clearly see the immense detail we have in the volume. And again, we, you would go to converting this to a, a fog, and then you would um, use the volume wrangle here to get some density to it. These steps will take a bit you will see that we have some detail and my viewport is now really slow just because it has a very high res um, VDB. We have uh, 37 million voxels, which is probably a bit much, um, but it will add up like in, 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 your, in your render, it will look nice, but we can probably just go to 2.5, um, which should be a lot less voxels now. We are now at 18 million, which is more than half than we had before. And you can also crank up the density in the viewport like that. So it's looking a little bit more solid. And again, you can play with the noises and I will do that. I will make another little update and I'll just speed it up and, and play around until I'm satisfied with the look. But this is the general gist of this um, volume field. Um, maybe add a little bit more detail to the volume post um, post uh, generation. So um, for that, I again disable the geo render. If I render now, we should just see the volume, which we do. And I played around a little, but I want to add maybe a little bit high, more high frequency detail to this. And I will use the um, the displacement feature in here. So again, as I showed earlier, I'm just creating a noise. I'm creating a volume vector map like that. And I'm hooking these two things up like this. And the vector map, I want to make sure that it's color to sign and tangent space is off. And then I can should be able to play with the scale. If I hook this up now, you should now see um, we have some weird things going on. It might be because my step scale is not right, but we will see um, if that is the case. So just playing with the values, um, playing with the vector map scale and the noise scale, you can now see we have a little bit more like of a swirly pattern. And this is pretty cool. Um, again, we can specify how strong we want this effect to be. We can increase our vertical or horizontal um, details. We can add more octaves, which will add more fractal details to this. So it's now super detailed. And this is kind of what I said, but I want to add more details to it. And if you have a very low scale, um, you will just see it in a, really small instance and it's not too apparent you can see it's a little bit strong here let's visualize the top section a bit more you can see now we have definitely more detail if i store this snap snapshot and disconnect the displacement and we go before and after you will see that we did add even more high frequency detail to this and that way you do not need to generate these high detailed expensive bdbs but you kind of do something within the shader this is now with the volume in place. Uh, it's a pretty cool effect already. And as I said, you can change the colors. You can change, um, like you can use displacements on the outside to have more detailed breakups here if you need that or adjust the bump map. So there are lots of things you can do to make this even nicer. There's a, a small shader thing I like to do, which is super expensive um, to render. That means it's, it takes a long time to be noise free, but it does add lots of realism to uh, more crystal objects uh, or sapphires or something with a um, higher IOR. And that is called um, dispersion. Um, as I said, 
you can hover over this. It will give you some explanation. Um, the higher the number, the less you would see it. So if you do something like 20, um, this is quite strong, uh, but you will get this kind of color fringing where the wavelengths are broken up. So um, for this to render clean, I will change the render settings a little bit. So I go to my edit render node um, and I will change this um, the sampling from the transmission maybe to three and we go four, um, four A, and then I'll be back. All right, so with slightly adjusted render settings and dispersion added, we can clearly see we get the this color fringing here on the left and also this red, orange, and green shifting on, on the right-hand side here. Um, and this is because the ray is made up of three components when it enters a surface. And it kind of, based on um, the properties of the light photon, it will be split up in, in three different uh, rays, red, green, and blue, because that is the visible human color spectrum we can see. And based on the, the amount of refraction, the bumps and whatever, these lights, the, the photon is spread out in it, into its components. And that's why we see this fringing of color. And it's called dispersion. It's, it's as you can imagine, a bit more expensive uh, to render. So it, your renders will take longer, but it will overall look way more realistic, especially when it's in motion. You can see overall it's shifting a little bit towards green, um, but this is just the nature of this. And if we look through the AOVs, we do have our coat, um, which does really show the nice um, breakup we added on, on, these, on the surface itself. And then with the dispersion as well, you get the fringing now within that. At the bottom, you can see the rougher surface using the bump. And then we do have the volume direct, which is just the volume inside. And this gives us this really nice uh, 3D looking um, interior of the crystal. So next up, what I like to do for getting everything rendered, um, technically, or typically I render um, it like that, and that's totally fine. Sometimes I cache them out to disk and load them using the Arduino procedurals, but that's something uh, you can choose how you wish to do it. Um, and for rendering, I did anima an animation. So I just created a null at the top level here, which is just my rotate, uh, master or object, whatever. And this just connects to these both input ports. And all I had to, all I did was uh, I'll click on the Y axis here uh, to get a keyframe and then I'd frame 240, do a 360 and keyframe that. And now it's just rotating. And this helped me to just look at different angles uh, quite quickly and evaluate if things need to be done. And as you can clearly see for different angles, um, it works very well. We do have a different fringing here on the side. We see the, the volume of the inside in a different view. You can see that the, the cracks or the broken up edges, they have more scattering to it. Um, it already feels quite organic. All right, so one thing to discuss is uh, if we look at the reference, um, we can see that there is this, uh, this crack. I think it's actually really busted, this crystal. And you can clearly see that it has this kind of uh, broken line within. And you can also see it in my render. So um, it's really great, especially when it's rotating and it's catching the light. You can see how it's reflecting off and it just adds so much more um, to the crystal itself. So I want to show you how to do it. It's amazingly easy to do and it adds so much to the value uh, to your final render. And we have it like this. So you can see how it's subdivided. Um, if I go into the GeoCrystal working uh, section here, um, what we're going to do is essentially we just want to fracture it because once you fracture it, um, it has another geo side, a geo edge, and then the light will automatically reflect off that. So right now, this is obviously single-sided. Uh, we don't have anything in here, so we need to create some data. So what I like to do for these kind of fractures, I like to use a Boolean, a Boolean fracture, and a Boolean expects a cutting surface and the geo to fracture. So if I just use a grid like that um, and I visualize it, which is now 10 by 10, I probably want to make it two by two. Um, and you can see it's right there. I do want to move it. So you can either do it in here, hit enter and, and move it. So I'm just placing it now somewhere. Let's look through the camera, um, rotate this. 
let's say that is my cutting surface. And I want to use this now to fracture our geo. So if I pipe this in here, this in here, and I look through my Boolean fracture, um, it takes a bit of time because we do have a pretty dense in initial geo, but now we should have something. If I do an exploded view, you can see now we have these two pieces. How do we make this work somehow? If we, because if we render it like this, um, it's not really separated. We should still see it. We can actually um, have a look. Um, one thing what I want to do though, I want to create another stream here and I just want to call this two BDB. And um, if I, I want to, I do want to do this because right now our volume, like the cloud is using this section, the geo node. So I just want to copy this and in the geo volume section, um, while we use the object merge, I just want to use the new one we, I just created. So it's, it's using the other stream instead of the one I will be changing now. Right, so this is my out VDB, out to VDB, and then this will go in here, and then um, the out geo will become will come to the bottom like this, and this is then again what will be rendered. So if I go to the render view now, we we do have the the, the fractured um, edge. So let's see what happens if we render this now. All right, just by adding this simple boolean with a grid, we can already see in the render that we've got this nice separation. I think we can make a little bit more out of it. Once is to, uh, one thing is to adjust our grid pattern so it's not just a straight line. And then the other thing I would suggest is that we kind of offset it a little bit from the surface because um, the geo right now is essentially on top of each other. So you might get some um, Z space fighting. So there might be some um, flickering going on. So I want to show you a couple of tricks to uh, don't have it and to even make it look nicer. So as we, as we, as we know, we, um, we do just have a simple geo plane. So the first thing I like to do, as always, one of the most used nodes in, in my Houdini uh, yet is the mountain sub. And you can see it's already breaking up the surface. We can add more details to our plane. So we get a better um, cut surface. You can, yeah, obviously add more and more, but at some point, um, it won't be that noticeable, especially when you reduce the um, the details, which I want to do. I just want to have it a little bit more broken up. You will see that it's quite organic. You don't have these perfectly hard edges. It, it's mainly like a wiggly line with, with a little bit broader details. Um, so you can have a little bit of roughness, I guess, to get these. You don't want this. That's what I mean. Like you want to have a little bit of something. And then uh, this should be good. And even this might be a bit much, but we can see in the exploded view uh, what we are getting. So this is now like a more roundish cut, which is kind of cool. We have these details and all of these details will reflect as well. Um, what you want to do is uh, probably adjust the normal so you don't have these uh, hard edges. Like these things will probably look weird in the, uh, in the render. Um, and you probably also want to make sure that you roughly have a similar density. So um, the grid right now is probably still too coarse. So maybe let's go 200 um, like that. Check how the mountain now looks. Uh, looks a little bit more jagged, which is totally fine. So now um, let's just uh, fracture it again. And look at the exploded view, which is just separating them. And I think this kind of works. We now have uh, softer edges here. And this is pretty cool. Um, so I said something about separation, right? And I want to use a point vop to control this and this exploded view. So with the exploded view, we can just um, separate them like this. And let's say we want our maximum offset, maybe like that. We can also, um, if you want, you can also move one piece higher up. Um, so you could do a transform or um, let's just do a little transform. It, it depends what you want to do in the end, but you can just move it up a little and you will see um, what I mean by that. Um, do we actually have the pieces separated? We should. So we should be able to do this um, based on a piece zero. And now you can see that I am just moving one element up or down. And you can rotate it or you can do all sorts of things. What you want to do. Yeah. So that this is roughly the idea, but we want to use a point bob to control it even more. So if I create a point bob in here. Point is again similar to like we did on the volumes. It's like a visual coding context. So as you can see, I'm piping both in here. And if I look through this, 
Um, so you want to uh, create a point input point attribute, and that allows you to get the point position, the p position of the um, of your second input. So if I put that into position, you will see now that we have this offset piece. And if I if I put in the default one, you'll see it's connected again. So I want to mix these two things together somehow. First is we need to control the mixing. So I want to create a noise first. And if I visualize the noise with just plugging it into, um, into CD, um, we don't see much. Let me just do a range in here. And we also don't see much because it needs some position. So now we see actually something. Um, increase the frequency, something maybe like that. Reduce the roughness, something like that. Plug the fit into here, back into CD. And now we can control roughly what we want to kind of mix these things together. So um, how you mix it is using a mix node, which is in, uh, behind the scenes a LERP um, operation. So we want to mix the this regular clean point position with the um, fractured one, like that. And then we want to blend it to P. You can see now we have a 50% blend. And if I um, animate this, or if I just slide it, you will see that it grows. And I can then connect my noise to the bias. And now you will see that at some points um, it's connecting, then it's broken, breaking up again. And it's kind of like a little bit of an offset. Um, and this is driven by the noise. And as I said, um, based on the fit here, you can now control if you want to have it cracked open all the way, if you want it all together, if, or if you just want to have some cracks here and there, and then uh, overall a little bit of a minor offset. And that's all I wanted to do. So this is now doing this. So now I'm hooking this back up here. And now our uh, crystal here has this nice um, ridge, which is offset a little. So let me um, save this snapshot and then I'll render again and we we'll compare. Now we do have the adjusted render. Um, obviously with the new glass crack in here, the reflections internally change as well. That's why we don't get the one-to-one -one look. Um, but with the new um, adjusted point position version, you see we do not have this weird shadowing going on here, which could be a render error, especially if you render an uh, animated sequence. Um, that's uh, And this is now correct because we do not have any uh, Z fighting in here. So um, this should be rendering all good. So um, this was, I think, a quite easy step to really add some more realistic um, touch to your crystal render. Even this one, you can see the cracks in here. And then depending on what, how it's kind of shattered, you get a kind of different look. You see, this one is pretty straight up and there are all sorts of different shapes and obviously um, lots of inspiration to create different looks. So now we are in Nuke, which is an industry standard compositing tool. Um, I'm quite com familiar with that as I've been using this for quite a long time. Needless to say, I'm not a compositor itself. I just know the basic things, I would say. Um, so these are my three different renders. These are um, the ones I did before recording the tutorial itself. So um, if you if you follow the tutorial one by one, you will not get exactly this result. But the benefit for you is I am uploading all the scene files for you. So you can go to my Patreon page and you can get this nuke file or you can get the um, Houdini file to really render the same thing if you need to. But yeah, so the, these are my three rendered versions. So one, two, and three. And you can clearly see that we do have this nice uh, volumetric effect in the middle. And we do have... Um, yeah, the, the, the broken up stuff at the bottom. I added a bit more noises in the, in the lower regions here. These are just um, a noise affected by the bottom uh, region. Um, anyways, let's talk about the comp. So these are my layers I have. So I do have my codes and my normal passes, position passes and all of that stuff. Um, the first thing I'm doing is unpre-multiplying. So when I do color adjustments, I'm not doubling up the edges or I'm not creating any weird color shifts. Um, so the first thing I notice, um, it feels quite noisy and I just tried to find which pass it is. And it's, it's one of the passes which are noisy are um, the volume pass, which is this one. You can see it's super noised up here, um, only at the bottom part. Um, so what I'm trying to do, I'm using um, a reduced noise, which is um, from Neat Video, which you can use and you, have, you, it, you apply it and it figures out the noise levels and softens it out and tries to get um, rid of the noise. 
Sometimes it's more effective than other times, but it's a little bit blurry, but it's fine. After that, I'm sharpening it a little bit to get a little bit more detail. And then I'm just color correcting the interior volume by just using a simple grade with some little bit color correction. And to get this going, I, I have my crystal here. I'm subtracting this path from it, this one. And then once it's gone, I'm adding it back on top. So this is now back in. So I can do these adjustments and it will not really um, change other paths. It will only affect a single pass. Um, what I did up here, um, I extracted the coat. I um, cleaned up, reduced some noise. I graded it to be a little bit more um, localized, more contrasty. So I reduced the gamma, increased the, um, the gain a little bit just to make it a little bit more crunchy from here to here. And this, I'm adding it on top of the existing spec. So it gets a little bit more um, shiny. It's, it looks more like a polished surface. Without that, it will be a little bit more dull. You can see I'm adding a little bit more range in these regions here. Um, next, I'm doing the, the interior stuff. Then I'm just copying the clean alpha channel back. And then I'm pre-multiplying it to, um, to make sure my edges are good. Um, after that, I did a little bit of a sharpen. I, I always like this kind of look. Obviously, you have to play with it, so it's not it, so it's not looking too processed. And this might be even this might be a little bit too much, but it's again you can play around with this. Um, then I'm deleting all the channel channels except depth, so my list in here is now a lot uh, less. If I look through this now, you can see I only have depth, and I only have um, you'll see the depth is in here now. The depth queuing of the crystal. So I can use this pass to control where I want to have focus and out of focus regions. You can use ZD focus. Um, and if you visualize it, you will see that I do have my focal, my layer set up. So this is my focal point and everything else will be blurred accordingly. And the same with PG Bokeh. PG Bokeh is a lot slower, but for my taste, it just looks Better. I think the depth of field works just better with um, PG book, uh, Bokeh, but it's totally up to you. I have a little library of um, filters here, which you can grab from Nukepedia as well, or you just Google for Bokeh library for Nuke and you get all of these things as well. I'm using this filter shape. Um, a small thing I like to do as well is chromatic aberration, which is essentially lens, dis uh, lens color fringing. And this is not a real lens aberration. It's just essentially scaling the X, Y, and Z components. And if I increase this, you will see um, what it's doing. It's really just kind of scaling them from the center. And if you play it down really low, I have it on a five here. Um, it's really subtle, but it just helps to um, create this more like a lensing effect on it. And most of these notes I'm using um, are from Nukepedia. So if you go to Nukepedia and look for chromatic aberration, or you download the um, this tool set here, which I keep forgetting, the Nuke Survival Kit, um, then you have lots of these tools available for you as well. Um, this one here, this range, I did that to control the highlights because if I use the glow, the exponential glow, for some angles, it was just extremely bright and we got this really strong uh, glow like this. And with the color correct, I was able to control it a little bit. So in the ranges, you can um, control how strong you want to have it affected in certain regions. And just with this, I was able to reduce it and only in the highlights. And then I just was reducing the highlights. And then um, without creating banding, you can kind of control it a little bit. And yeah, the exponential glow, is more, again, like a lensing effect. When you have light sources hitting the lens, you get this kind of a reflection go, uh, coming back to you. And this is what I wanted to, to try and mimic with, with, the, with the exponential glow node. And you can visualize it. If I affect only, this is what it's doing. And in, internally, it's just adding or plusing this on top of the beauty layer like that. Reformatting it, putting it on a gray background, uh, background like this doing a vignette so it's a bit darker on the edges, doing a little bit of grain on top. Uh, I like to do that, I don't know, it's just a habit I do. It's just adding a little bit of a film grain here. And yeah, and that is it. And then I'm, I did render this and um, this is the final product. So I hope you um, enjoyed this really in-depth step-by-step tutorial on how to create crystals. 
And again, on the CG Lounge, we do have this uh, crystal challenge as well. If you would like to apply these techniques and potentially win one of these amazing prizes we have on the CG Lounge. Um, if you want to follow that, the link is in the description below. Um, and again, I would always be happy to see you apply my techniques and it would be nice to see if you use them, if you can tag me in your social media pages so I can see what you are up to and what you're doing with uh, the contents I produce for you. So thanks. I hope you enjoyed this really in-depth tutorial and I hope I see you in the next one.